Absolutely. So the next two questions are kind of around Braille and teaching math to a Braille reader. And then how did you teach Braille in the first place? Um, if Campbell, you were a Braille reader before homeschooling and how that um, played out. Well, actually, we, our district didn't have a full-time teacher of the visually impaired ever. So we had they contracted with the School for the Blind at the state. So we only got an hour a week of Braille instruction ever, um, and pre including preschool when she was trying to learn Braille. So she was in a Montessori preschool, which was already accommodated for her without any accommodations because it's a multi-sensory approach. So everything was pretty accessible there. But then that teacher would come in one hour a week and we would meet before school started because once the other kids were there, Campbell was not going to do her reading at all she was too distracted by you know fun things <laughs> so she would come I think it was every Wednesday an hour before school started and we would do braille I would sit in those lessons and she would teach me and Campbell at the same time um, and then leave us what to do for the next week so then every hour I mean every day before school I, we would come an hour before and she and I would work an hour before on Braille reading. So it was kind of like having a teacher's aide who knew Braille. Um, but I mean, obviously I was the parent instead. And then when she went to public school, it was, she did, it was still just an hour and that was O&M and Braille in an hour a week. Um, and then she had a, a teacher's aide who did know Braille, who taught herself Braille right before Campbell started school there. And she would be the transcriber and that kind of stuff. Um, at that point, she was reading fluently, though. She went into public school in first grade, so she was reading pretty fluently. Now, then when we got to fourth, fifth grade work, whenever she was, she left fourth grade, we started homeschooling in fifth grade. The math is what I was most concerned about, because in fifth grade, you haven't been exposed to all the math signs yet. So as they would come up in her textbooks, we would just have to kind of figure that out. Um, either whether I Google searched it or ask another blind adult, like, what is the sign for this? Um, but they were so few and far between, you know, like they don't introduce all the new signs at one time, like, you know, they come gradually. So it wasn't that difficult, you think? Like, yeah, I would agree. If you were going from scratch, say you started homeschooling, you know, from the beginning, um, there are actually, I think APH maybe offers some online Braille courses, um, including one for Nemeth, um, which could be good for a parent, if you're trying to, you know, teach your kid, um, maybe you just stay, you don't even have to know all of Nemeth before you teach them. You may even just stay, you know, a week ahead of where they're going to be um, and you help them out. Or you could, you know, have, you know, someone teach them virtually, like through Tech Vision, which is where I got some assistive technology training. It's an organization that teaches assistive technology, Braille, and that kind of thing. And they actually, um, I actually was a, a Braille teacher for a while for a couple of, of students. Um, so it can be done that way as well, if you would rather not teach it yourself. And I think that Braille is nothing to be afraid of. I know that everyone makes a huge deal about it when you first find out that your child's going to be a Braille reader, but it's just like learning any other code, you know, right. and and you don't learn it all at once. Um, Campbell learned five letters at a time. You know, we started, she was learning the same letters that the kids were learning in print. And we would just gradually go. And I didn't have to be able to read it myself to be able to type it. I could have a cheat sheet. And still, when she's at school, I'll send her an Easter card or a Valentine's card or something. And I have to have my cheat sheet to type things in Braille, even though we've been doing this for 20 years, you know. So it's not... It's not like it's the parent has to be fluent in order for the child to be fluent. Yes. And she loved to find my mistakes. Like if I type stuff and it has all kinds of typos in it, she would think it was hilarious. <laughs> but, you know, and then encourage me to that. Oh, mommy didn't have any typos this mm -hmm. time. Good job. You know, <laughs> So I mean, it's nothing to be afraid of. And I think that a lot of parents are scared because they don't know Braille and they feel like they need to know it. And that goes for anything, too, because. People are like, how did you, did you teach chemistry and AP physics? And like, I never even took those classes and I didn't have to teach them. I just have to find her the material so that she can learn it. And you're more a facilitator as a homeschool parent than a teacher. Um, I cannot say that I'm fluent in any of the subjects that she took and they outgrow me somewhere around fifth grade math. Like I cannot, 
I'm so terrible at math. Yeah. Just never fall into the trap of thinking that because everything is digitized now, Braille is not necessary. That is yeah. absolutely not true. Do not never think that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I think you're at a huge, um, it's a harder in college if you're not a braille reader. Right. I actually have a friend right now who's low vision at Harvard and she didn't learn braille. And so she's finding that she needs it. And so one of my other blind friends is teaching her at the moment and she's juggling that on top of her schoolwork and you do not want to be in that situation. So yeah. just save yourself the trouble. It's much easier to learn it when they're little if you can. Yeah. And of course, I know some kids lose their vision and then have to learn it later. Um, but, you know, I think as soon as you can is the best time to learn it, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. And the last question is, what does a day or a week or even the school year look like if you're working outside of the home or, you know, your study? Where are you guys doing all of the things that you did throughout the year? Well, when we first started homeschooling, I worked three part-time jobs. Um, well, I owned a business, I owned a dance studio, and then I also coached a dance team, and then I did choreography for a musical every year. So those hours were a little crazy. So I didn't go into work till three in the afternoon, and I would work till about 10 at night, typically. So I guess you would call that second shift, right? Yeah. Um, but I do have friends who homeschool who work normal you know, nine to five jobs. Um, a lot of nurses I know homeschool because they can work 12s, you know, like four 12s and three 12s. So the key is that I think is that homeschooling can happen anywhere. You don't have to have this big fancy Pinterest classroom mm -hmm. uh, in your home. So if you do, it's probably going to get destroyed. Um, so we kind of just homeschooled wherever. Um, spent a lot of van schooling between mm -hmm commuting we called it van schooling um, yes. because I would take Campbell to Asheville for O&M twice a month and then my other daughter dances in Knoxville um, you know three nights a week and they have piano in Maryville which all of these places are at least an hour from us we live in the in a very rural community um, so we did it just kind of you can take your stuff wherever you know it's not the classroom can be anywhere we did a lot of coffee shops while Campbell was in O&M we would homeschool in the coffee shop and when we were home we like to have the flexibility of, of schooling year round because if the weather was nice, say we might want to go to the theme park or um, and just take a day off, or we would like to homeschool outside whenever we could as well. Right. Um, I um, spent a lot of time outside. I think if it was like 40 degrees or above, and especially if the sun was out, I was usually outside, yeah. <laughs> um, which I realized um how much I was outside when I went to school this year because I didn't have time to be outside in college and then the first time I sat outside in the sun I got fried and that never happens <laughs> because I was just outside a lot um so yeah I would do schoolwork outside um I always tried to schedule some sort of daily walk in as well um in the summer and spring it'd be in the mornings and the winter it'd be in the afternoons um, so I liked to do that. Um, always tried to practice piano every day as well. And because I have a keyboard with headphones, sometimes if I didn't have time during the day, I would end up doing that at around 11 p.m. <laughs> um, with my headphones once I got a keyboard. So I think flexibility is key. My best friend is a few years younger than me, and he's homeschooled and always has no idea what grade he's in because um, he homeschools year round um so the you know blank look when you ask a homeschooler what grade they're in is kind of typical sometimes because you may be finishing up work from ninth grade and then you know doing some work for 11th grade and then some 10th grade work all at the same time just to, because you can move at your own pace mm -hmm. um, and then you know as long as you graduate on time you're you're good yeah. And even then, like Campbell took a super senior year. Right. So on time is relative, you know, um, she had plenty of credits to graduate, you know, in her normal graduation year. Um, but she got a late start on assistive technology. So um, she wanted to take an extra year to do that, to compete another year in piano mm -hmm. and to work two internships. I mean, you that's the great thing about homeschooling is you can be flexible. And like her first internship, 
when did that start? You were 15? Yeah, I was 15. And there was some pretty intensive training involved. It was for testing. It was website accessibility testing. Um, and so some of my schoolwork took a bit of a back seat while I was doing that training. Um, it took about at least like a month. Yeah. Yeah. Training. So she could take a month off of school and, you know, kind of do some here and there, but not the schedule she was maintaining mm -hmm. um, to get that training in. And so she's certified as an ADA website tester now because she did that month of training. Whereas if I had been rigid about it and said, no, you can't do that. You're just going to have to wait till school's out. We're going to wait and do it in the summer. But because we school year round um, in our state, it's four hours. And I think it's actually about to change to six and a half hours a day is what they consider homeschooling 180 days a year. But it doesn't matter when those 180 days happen. So um, we could take, I think one year we took a month for Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, we did a little House on the Prairie series and, um, you know, kind of did some old colonial type stuff uh, for Christmas that year. And um and that's still learning, you know, it's all learning, but we like to have enough flexibility. And every year when I report their attendance, they never had less than 200 days. And I was like, so I didn't, after the first year and Campbell had like 230 days of school. And I was like, why am I even stressing about this? You know, I'll just keep track of it on my little paper calendar, mm -hmm. what days we take off completely. And then all the other days are school days. And, um, and then I just report them at the end of each semester. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the flexibility is the best part. Um, I, can, I could see that it might be a problem for some people if you had kids who, you know, just wanted to take every day off. But um, I don't, I mean, even on our days off, they did things like she would, like she said, practice piano every day, read something every day. Mm -hmm. You know, she always has a book going. So, yeah. and those were things that I just, I wanted to do. So if your kid has some sort of hobby as well or something they like to do, if they, you know, watch YouTube all the time, then you can, you know, suggest videos that they would like, but that are also educational. Um, or if they play video games, I'm sure that there are. Oh, yeah, there's a whole know, Minecraft curriculum. Right, there, there is. So one of the best things about homeschooling is you can tailor it to your child's interests as well. And actually, I, I started reading a lot. Um, about, you know, educating students with other disabilities in addition to blindness. And for, for disabilities like autism, that's actually what they tell you to do um, in the first place um, is to, you know, tailor their education around their interests. And I think that that's a good approach for, for any kid um, because then, you know, they actually enjoy learning. And they tend to retain it you know, better than if you're just regurgitating lectures and you know taking exams all the time I think they retain more of it if they're actually interested in it. and we're like that as adults too mm -hmm. I mean how much of school do you re remember and yeah. if you do is it it's a, usually the fun stuff that you do remember not not anything that was tedious right right so I think um the general week could be that we did school um say like pianos were on Thursday, piano lessons were on Thursday, then we would, you know, do school Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, take Thursday to just do piano and whatever we needed, shopping or whatever in Knoxville, which they would typically do school in the van too. So that would count that, you know, I don't know, some days we even did Saturdays and Sundays, especially labs for science I like to do those when her dad was home mm -hmm. um so we would do those on the weekends a lot yeah um, and sometimes dad would just bring home a surprise science lab with something interesting that he'd you know done at work that day mm -hmm. um so and that, when we say lab we're not talking about like a microscope I mean we're we just had a lab on pulleys because for a visually impaired kid a pulley doesn't make a lot of sense. You've never seen one, you know? And so we actually had pulleys that he brought. I don't even remember what we had them from. I think maybe from hanging backdrops for the dance studio. Yeah. And he had them in the garage. And so we got them in, and hung them on uh, our porch swing and just talked about how they worked and let her feel that um, hands on. So, you know, when we're talking labs, that's what we're talking about. Not like an actual microscope with slides and 
dissecting frogs and things like that yeah although we did do that with my uncle who's a stem teacher yeah. we were like his guinea pigs for his lab class yeah we did dissect a shark and a frog a sheep's eye a I sheep think. eyeball yeah that smell but yeah but you know and and that's another thing as homeschoolers you kind of just can take opportunities like that just came up we didn't plan that ahead of time he was like hey would y'all want to do this and mm-hmm. so you know you have the freedom to do that so I think that's a lot of of the perks of homeschooling is being able to just take opportunities as you can as they come up absolutely well I think it's amazing and this has been a lot of information on how to get started when you're considering homeschooling so thank you both I know there's more to come in the next couple of videos thank Thank you. you